Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Welcome today to today's webinar. Uh, today's topic is the French tax authorities, a different perspective on taxation. And the presentation will, uh, will be presented by Vincent Renault from Techlin Associates from France, a TPA member. Uh, over to you, Vincent. Yes, thank you, Rosanna. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, we thought it would be a, a good idea to let you know uh, on the way transfer pricing tax audits are, are carried out in France. Uh, maybe just an introduction, uh, which is not in the slides, but to tell you um, that we have uh, in France a, a very weak uh, regulation on transfer pricing. That's Article 57 of the French tax code, but there are a few things in it. And the tax authorities, uh, they uh, in fact usually refer uh, to the uh, OECD uh, regulations, uh, but it has remained some sort of soft law. It took time before the uh, uh, administrative courts uh, in case law uh, mentioned uh, the uh, OECD principles, uh, which they do now uh, as a sort of help to rezoning. Uh, but uh, we don't have, as that can be the case in other uh, jurisdictions, uh, specific regulations explaining uh, transfer pricing, explaining the method, explaining the benchmarks. Uh, we don't have that. So it's a sort of gray area. French tax authorities like to say that uh, transfer pricing is not an exact science, and this is what you discover uh, all along the uh, tax audits. So um, the first uh, uh, part that I wanted to talk about, because uh, it, I think it's good for you to have a, a, a description of what uh, you need to provide uh, as a documentation. Uh, this is the uh, French transfer pricing documentation requirements. In fact, uh, you have a bunch of various obligations uh, which came into law uh, depending on, on sometimes uh, on, on various reasons that can be uh, the BEPS, that can be the European Commission, uh, or that can be some uh, uh, political pressure uh, to fight against uh, tax avoidance. Uh, so uh, we have uh, various uh, various thresholds for the application of this documentation and uh, we have uh, various reasons uh, for their existence. Some can be viewed as a help to target tax audits and some uh, are specifically dedicated uh, in the running of tax audits. So uh, the first one I wanted to mention is uh, the one you know very well is the CBCR. Uh, this is applicable for uh, companies that have uh, into a group uh, that have a turnover superior to 750 uh, million euro uh, on a consolidated basis. So this is going to give a lot of information to the French tax authorities on the group uh, and can help them, of course, to target a, a tax audit on a specific group. Uh, then we have uh, a specific provision uh, for, this is Article L13AA. Uh, this is for multinational companies that have a turnover superior to 400 million euro. Uh, and in that case, you need to give a documentation on the first day of the tax audit. And in case you don't have it, you only have uh, 30 days to provide it. This documentation is very similar to uh, what you can know in all the jurisdictions and to the OECD regulations. <clears throat> you have a master file and a local file. Uh, one thing to mention is that the French tax authorities are, are not too strict uh, on the formal uh, presentation of the documentation. What they will be looking at, in fact, is the uh, functional analysis, the transfer pricing method used, and the evidence that is brought forward that the uh, prices uh, applied are at arm's length. That is to say, uh, in most of the cases, uh, the benchmark study. Now, uh, we have guidelines in France for uh, what should the master file contain and what should the local file contain. But uh, in practice, uh, when you, you are into a tax audit, uh, the tax inspector is really focusing on the elements I mentioned. If you don't have the documentation, and uh, surprisingly, uh, I have experienced that uh, uh, in many multinational groups, uh, the documentation is not necessarily ready, uh, you can have a penalty, 0.5% uh, of the 
uh, amounts of non-documented transactions or 5% of the tax adjusted amounts if this is higher. So this is the first uh, obligation of documentation for, let's say, multinational companies that would be considered as sufficiently big. For the other groups, uh, you have a specific article, Article L13B, uh, but this article uh, can be uh, uh, raised by the French tax authorities in case uh, they have uh, brought the evidence, a prima facie evidence, that there was some sort of tax avoidance. And then once they bring this evidence, they will ask for a transfer pricing documentation. Because uh, it's complicated to bring that kind of evidence, uh, this article is in fact never used. I have never, never experienced uh, its use by the French tax authorities. And in fact, they use another mean uh, on which I will come back a little bit uh, later. Uh, and uh, last, we have a, a specific uh, declaration, which is applicable to all groups, big or small, uh, when they have a turnover of 50 million, uh, 50 million in France this time, not on a consolidated basis. And in that case, uh, they need to file a specific uh, declaration six months after the closing of the financial year. Uh, in this declaration, they are going to indicate uh, the main flows uh, of uh, intercompany transactions that can be uh, services like management fees, license fees, sale of products, and financial uh, transactions. And uh, they, they just put you just put the uh, uh, the initials of, of the countries concerned, like uh, Great Britain will be GB or uh, Germany will be GER, uh, Netherlands will be NL, and you put all transactions as long as they have uh, a, a, an amount superior to 100,000 euro, and indicate the transfer pricing method used. Uh, this is clearly um, used to target tax audits because, uh, for instance, if you have 1 billion euro uh, of uh, flow of transactions uh, towards Switzerland and Netherlands from France, uh, basically and obviously uh, this is going to be uh, raising uh, a tax audit uh, in the near future. And finally, uh, when I mentioned the Article L13B, uh, this is the article that they use, the tax authorities, most of the time, Article L10. It's a general article that uh, requires the taxpayer to give all necessary information uh, on uh, the accounting entries uh, he has uh, in his uh, tax return. So uh, instead of using uh, the Article L13B, which is specifically used for transfer pricing, they use the L10 to ask about uh, transfer pricing questions. And uh, in many cases, uh, my advice has been to companies that it is better to describe with your own word uh, the way uh, the intercompany flows and intercompany uh, agreements are working uh, than to answer the questions of the tax authorities. So this is why in many cases, uh, even if uh, it is for groups that have a turnover or gross assets uh, inferior to 400 million euro, where you have to deliver the transfer pricing documentation on the first day of the tax audit, I advise to have a transfer pricing documentation ready uh, in case uh, you have transfer pricing questions, which you now uh, in France usually always have. So uh, we have now uh, a picture of the uh, transfer pricing documentation requirements, and we can enter on the next sli slide uh, in the uh, uh, precise uh, tax audits uh, and the practice of the French tax authorities in tax audits. So uh, this is what I call management of transfer pricing tax audits. Uh, a little description uh, on the way it works uh, on the administrative side. I think it's important to know uh, uh, how uh, they are organized uh, on the other side. So you have uh, usually for uh, multinational groups, the DVNI, this is uh, the uh, tax audit squads uh, that are uh, auditing uh, multinational companies. They will, be, they will have jurisdiction over uh, a taxpayer in France uh, when uh, there is in France over uh, 150 million turnover. Again, this is a turnover in France, not on a consolidated basis. Uh, usually, uh, they will audit the groups, but sometimes it can be uh, local squads uh, if, uh, for instance, the group has uh, 
uh, in a French region, a subsidiary. Uh, in that case, the local squad has to ask the permission to the DVNI to carry out the tax audit. Uh, and sometimes uh, in a multinational group, uh, if you have various subsidiaries, you, you can have uh, all together uh, a local uh, tax audit and a DVNI tax audit. Um, the, the, the DVNI uh, has a tax inspector uh, and they are specialized by sector of uh, activity. So, uh, for instance, I gave you an example, the 11th and 12th uh, squad uh, are specialized in the food industry and the 15th squad is specialized in the luxury goods industry. So, uh, usually uh, the tax audit is run by a tax inspector. When it's a big group, it can be two tax inspectors, but they are not specialized in transfer pricing. Nevertheless, uh, you can be sure that they are going to uh, deeply investigate uh, transfer pricing issues uh, because uh, the time uh, where uh, the tax inspector has little knowledge of transfer pricing is uh, is finished. Uh, now uh, they know uh, the questions to ask and sometimes they even themselves carry out uh, benchmark studies uh, even though they are not transfer pricing specialists. Yet when this is needed uh, they can ask specialists into the DVNI uh, they have a financial specialist uh, to uh, investigate uh, the market rate of a loan uh, and they have a transfer pricing specialist uh, and when necessary also uh, on a aim at transfer pricing purposes uh, they can ask uh, the involvement of, of the uh, IT specialist this is called the BVCI they are specialized in the uh, auditing for tax purposes of course uh, the uh, software system of the companies and, and therefore, uh, they can look, for instance, into uh, the way uh, the uh, uh, cost of a product is uh, construed. Um, so when you have a, a, a tax audit, uh, usually this gives rise to a tax adjustment. Uh, the company, and this is the procedure, the company answers. Uh, then the uh, inspector answers to the comments of the taxpayer. And uh, at this time, you can have appeal uh, to uh, the uh, uh, chief of squad uh, of the taxpayer and to uh, later on in the second stage uh, to the uh, DVNI directors uh, who can review the whole case. So you have two layers of appeal uh, with the help of uh, international tax specialist. Uh, I gave you the name, uh, Mr. Kahana, who was very much involved uh, uh, on the case we are talking, we are going to talk about after, uh, which is the Google case, uh, and Mr. Belnou, uh, who just comes uh, from, uh, has just been appointed, uh, coming from uh, the the uh, local regional Paris area uh, squad. Uh, so this is uh, the way it works uh, in in DVNI, and then you have uh, potentially uh, tax audits that are conducted conducted by the DIRCOFI. So in Paris, this is the squads uh, that are, uh, have just jurisdiction on companies for the Paris region. Uh, and you have other uh, regional uh, tax squads. Uh, they can be involved in uh, transfer pricing. Uh, and uh, Dircofi has some uh, transfer pricing uh, specialists uh, that will come to help uh, the tax inspectors. So uh, basically speaking, uh, when you have a tax audit of a company, it's a general tax audit uh, looking at all matters like corporate tax, VAT, local taxes. But transfer pricing uh, will always be looked at and uh, when necessary can involve a transfer pricing specialist. But a lot of the tax inspectors now uh, have sufficient knowledge of transfer pricing or at least they think they have. Uh, to conduct the transfer pricing audit uh, on their own. So uh, on the next slide, uh, we are going to look at the way uh, the French tax authorities uh, look at uh, transfer pricing. Uh, as I said, uh, for a rather long time, uh, because uh, our regulations are uh, very weak, and we just have a small paragraph on Article 57 of the French Tax Code. The transfer pricing uh, tax audit remained in a very gray area. Uh, 
and uh, the French tax authorities uh, had uh, many uh, different and contradictory positions. Uh, not so far away, for instance, uh, some of them, uh, that, that sounds strange to say, but 10 years ago, not so far away, uh, some of them would look at uh, gross margins and compare in the pharmaceutical industry uh, the gross margin of a company, of a given company, with the ones of its direct competitors, all of them belonging to multinational groups. So this does not make sense, but that's the way they would do. So uh, there was really a lack of method and uh, centralization of, of, of doctrine, if I may say, um, which now um, no longer exists. And uh, most of the time, uh, a reference is made to uh, the uh, OECD uh, method, although uh, these methods uh, are not at all uh, mentioned in our regulations. Um, we don't even really have uh, uh, administrative guidelines. We have guidelines for many uh, other topics like uh, corporate tax, VAT, and so on. For transfer pricing, we just have a sort of guide for uh, small size companies when they become international. But we have nothing, nothing, no guidelines for multinational company. That's very strange. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, no regulations. Uh, and using the OECD principles, therefore, which remains a sort of soft law, uh, is done by the French tax authorities through uh, the tax treaties uh, and Article 9. And uh, by Article 9, they derive, uh, in fact, the OECD transfer pricing regulations. Uh, and, and, and therefore claim that they are applicable uh, in France. And, and in fact, uh, what the French tax authorities have discovered, and this is also one of the reasons why uh, the French tax inspectors uh, look at transfer pricing themselves, because they have found out that they have a, a fantastic tool at their disposal to make tax adjustments. Uh, that is not so difficult to use. And this is uh, the uh, uh, TNMM, uh, the uh, Transactional Net Margin Method. Uh, and in fact, uh, I could say that uh, in most of the cases, nearly all the cases, uh, the only method that the French tax authorities and that DV and I know, uh, at least when uh, they conduct a tax audit, not when you discuss with them, but when they conduct a tax audit, is the TNMM. The TNMM is the uh, golden method that they use all the time. Uh, so uh, this approach uh, they have developed, uh, in particular for uh, inbound investments, that, that, that would be for the French subsidiary of an international group, but also for outbound investments, that is for uh, foreign subsidiaries of uh, French groups. Um, and why, why they do that? Uh, because uh, they found out that it's very easy to use. Uh, in case another method is used, uh, the French tax authorities will substitute the TNMM, uh, arguing that the method used is not correct. Uh, in many cases, the substitution grounds are very weak, but nevertheless, that's what they do. Uh, and they use the TNMM uh, at all times. And they found out that uh, if you have, for instance, a subsidiary with, uh, which is loss making, it's very easy. You make the TNMM, you have the benchmark study, uh, the, even the tax inspector, they know a little bit how to do that. Uh, and uh, and that they go to the median, they apply the median, and that's it. Uh, they have their tax adjustments. Uh, very easy, big numbers, uh, no much work. So usually, uh, this is the way uh, the transfer pricing uh, audits are conducted. Uh, when you discuss uh, in course of the administrative appeals that I, I described, uh, the chief of squad, where you can have an appeal, and the DVNI directors, when you discuss uh, at a higher level, uh, of course, you can discuss of other uh, methods, um, but uh, such as profit splits, for instance, uh, but it is also a sort of uh, pragmatic approach to reach a settlement and to reach uh, a given number. Uh, but it is 
uh, clearly not the method that they, they would prefer. And uh, we don't have in France, I think, so many groups that are using uh, a profit split approach. Uh, but uh, the tax authorities, they know this, but they don't like it too much. Uh, we had a session in TPA about the value chain analysis. Uh, this is uh, rarely uh, considered uh, by the French tax authorities uh, because they are so much focused on, on the TNMM. Uh, we will see later on that probably uh, this is going to change uh, when we will discuss the uh, uh, OECD uh, works, uh, in particular on the GAFA uh, and on the Pillar 1. But in the current tax audits, the, the TNMM is really the golden rule, uh, as I uh, just mentioned before. Um, in many cases, uh, some groups try to uh, put forward the CUP method. Uh, usually, the tax authorities really uh, don't like it, and, and they try to reject it. Uh, there are still uh, a lot of uh, groups in France, uh, I mean subsidiaries of foreign groups, uh, that are using a sort of cup method, uh, in particular uh, groups uh, that are family groups, uh, because uh, they had, uh, uh, in many cases, a way to uh, determine the selling price based on a sort of cost plus. Uh, with a markup on, on, on the production costs. And, and they started to sell to uh, third parties uh, using this method. And then they apply this method to uh, the subsidiaries. Uh, and they think they have a sort of cup because they would sell at some price uh, in Germany or in, uh, in the UK. Uh, and, and to a related company, they will use the same method uh, for selling to the French subsidiary. Uh, this usually is, is never going to be accepted by the French tax authorities. Uh, that will just apply the TNMM method, uh, in particular when uh, the subsidiary is in a loss-making situation. Now, uh, uh, having said that, um, the use of the TNMM is, is also an advantage uh, because, in fact, it, it really limits the impact of a tax adjustment uh, because uh, uh, in, in, in many cases, uh, the tax authorities uh, will write for uh, explaining the uh, substitution of method that uh, France is a very important market for this subsidiary, uh, that there are some specific uh, intangibles that have been developed in France, and that uh, the remuneration is not sufficiently uh, represented uh, in the accounts uh, of the French company. Uh, but then they are going to apply the TNMM method. They are going to use uh, some benchmark analysis uh, with independent comparables. And in many cases, the outcome of this analysis is that uh, you will end up for in the distribution company, for instance, with two or three percent of the turnover uh, as a profit. Uh, and this uh, clearly limits uh, the impact uh, of uh, the uh, tax adjustment and creates, in a way, a, a paradoxical situation because uh, uh, after having written that there is uh, intangible in France, uh, the outcome of, of, of this uh, conclusion is uh, to treat the French entity like a sort of uh, low-risk distributor. So um, the TNMM can be an advantage uh, for uh, profitable groups uh, that have a, a subsidiary in France. Uh, then for outbound investments, uh, that is French groups that have subsidiaries uh, abroad, uh, in fact, uh, the TNMM is a way for the French tax authorities uh, to get back to their old idea that uh, for a French group, all the profits uh, should be made uh, in France and very little should be left abroad. So uh, in that case, uh, when they have direct sales, uh, but that's one of the problem because you don't necessarily have a, a direct sales situation uh, from France to a foreign subsidiary. Sometimes you have various intermediaries uh, outside France. Uh, when you have a direct sales situation, for sure, the TNMM method is going to strongly limit uh, the, um, the uh, uh, level of profits that would be realized outside France and therefore in that case uh, can uh, justify in the eyes of the tax authorities a, a very high uh, tax adjustment. Um, of course, uh, but as you uh, probably know, uh, 
this raises the issue of the comparability of the comparables, uh, in particular when you talk about uh, Asian uh, subsidiaries, uh, depending on the uh, sector you, you look at, uh, you don't find comparables necessarily in a specific country. So for instance, uh, uh, if you look at Japan or Hong Kong, uh, the French tax authorities will use comparables located in Thailand or Korea. Uh, and uh, the comparables that you find uh, are really uh, not comparable at all uh, to as far as you look at the, uh, uh, the activity of, of the group that is uh, tax audited. So, um, in uh, in many cases, uh, the TNMM method uh, raises the issue of the uh, uh, comparable approach. Uh, so um, now we are going to go on the next slide. And uh, this is um, what I call the keys uh, for a, a good settlement. Uh, because uh, what you have to know in that uh, in most uh, of the cases uh, from my experience from the experience of other uh, tax lawyers um, the uh, transfer pricing uh, tax adjustments uh, end up in a settlement uh, with the tax uh, authorities uh, this is very very often the case um, if we talk about the uh, policy uh, of uh, tax audits, um, we had a period uh, during the last presidency of uh, François Hollande where uh, the tax audits uh, were uh, much harder and it was less easy uh, to get uh, an agreement with the French tax authorities. Uh, in our practice, in our legal firm, uh, we have uh, multiplied uh, the uh, actions uh, in front of the uh, administrative courts uh, by probably three. Uh, so uh, it, it, for, for five years, it was much more difficult to uh, uh, obtain uh, agreements and settlements uh, with the French tax authorities. Things have totally changed uh, with this uh, new government and new president, uh, Mr. Macron. And uh, they have, in fact, gone back to uh, the previous uh, situation uh, before uh, the election of François Hollande. But uh, having said that, nevertheless, uh, in many cases, uh, it remains that uh, for transfer pricing issues, uh, in many cases, uh, a settlement is sought for by uh, the taxpayer. Uh, why is that? Uh, because uh, usually uh, transfer pricing adjustments can result in big numbers. Sometimes uh, some penalties are attached to these uh, adjustments. Uh, there are not only uh, corporate tax issues, but there are also uh, deemed distributed profit uh, when you have a tax adjustment for transfer pricing. So it means uh, withholding taxes. Uh, this is something that you have to pay, this is cash out. Uh, and you have local tax uh, consequences. Uh, further to uh, general electric case law, uh, where we have a, a local tax that is based on the added value uh, produced with a maximum rate of 1.5% uh, on this uh, added value. Uh, and uh, the Supreme Court uh, acknowledged, uh, I disagree with this, but acknowledged that in case there is a transfer pricing adjustment, uh, the added value uh, is impacted and therefore there is an additional added value tax to pay. So uh, transfer pricing adjustment means a significant cost on the one hand, but uh, on the other hand, uh, it can happen every year. Uh, so uh, because we have uh, a statute bar limitation of three years in France, uh, you can have three years audited uh, then you start fighting uh, the tax uh, the tax audit results and the, uh, the transfer pricing adjustments. Uh, but then the tax authorities can come back with uh, one, two, three more years. Then you have six years. And as time goes by, uh, at the end of the day, you, you finish probably with 10 years. 
uh, under a tax adjustment, and the numbers become to become very big. So uh, this is, I think, one of the reasons why, because there is a recurrent uh, task, tax exposure. Uh, this is the reason why uh, most of the groups uh, prefer to uh, settle down and get an agreement with the tax authorities. Um, so uh, how uh, do you discuss uh, a good uh, settlement? Uh, well, first of all, I think that you need to challenge the position of the French tax authorities, uh, which because this is like a, a carpet bazaar negotiation in a way. Uh, you have to uh, uh, you have to tell them that uh, their position is very weak. Uh, you have to shake them by presenting good arguments on that. Uh, and once they are a little bit shaked and not so sure that uh, in case they go to court, they will win you can start about uh, discussing on a better level uh, if your objective is to pay uh, the less uh, possible uh, corporate tax. Uh, if that is your objective, this is what you need to do. Uh, you can criticize the comparables, of course, uh, as I just said before, uh, giving the example of uh, uh, Japan and Hong Kong, uh, French tax authorities using comparables in Korea and, and Thailand. Uh, most of the time, the, the, the work of the tax authorities uh, has a, a lot of issues uh, as far as the comparables are concerned, and even as far as the uh, calculations uh, of uh, uh, profit ratios are, are made. Uh, it is really crazy, but this is also because there is a lack of regulation, as I said, in our tax code. But uh, you, you, you can have everything. You, you can have someone who will use, uh, under the TNMM approach, uh, 217 number for 217 and just one year. Uh, some will use uh, three years before with an average. Uh, some will use five years. Uh, some will use three years, including uh, the year they are considering, for for instance, if uh, uh, they criticize 2017, they will look at comparables for 15, 16, and 17. But the problem is that when you substitute a method, uh, you have to put you in the shoes of the taxpayer as if he had wanted to apply the TNMM. And if he had applied the TNMM for 2017, he would have done so in 2017, and he would not have the numbers uh, of the comparables for 2017. You would only have the numbers for the previous years, uh, like uh, 14, 15, and 16. So uh, you have all sorts of methods and all sorts of calculations. Uh, so this gives, uh, in fact, an opportunity uh, to criticize uh, what is being done. Uh, I experienced already uh, recently in a, a Dear Coffee tax adjustment, or surpassing tax adjustments, <laughs> Inside the same squad, inside the same squad, different ways of calculating uh, the uh, uh, profit ratios, that is the operating income divided by turnover. Different ways of calculation, different way uh, of uh, presenting the comparables uh, inside the same squad. So uh, uh, it's really, uh, really uh, strange. Um, what the tax authorities do is that uh, because they are helped by a general electric case law, uh, they, they, we had a, a TCL Belgium case law that said that you had to find, uh, to take the Q, you could take the Q1. In fact, the uh, intercartile, that is the, the, the closer uh, to uh, the level of profit of the uh, tax audited company. Uh, but uh, the General Electric case law said that the median uh, should be considered. So uh, usually now what they do is that they always take the median. Uh, so this you can criticize also because uh, for sure you just have to be into the uh, arm's length uh, interval. Uh, and you can also uh, claim about uh, uh, the uh, OECD panel one discussions. Um, the settlement can happen either at the level of the chief of squad, that is the chief of the tax inspector, or later on at the level of the uh, appeal officers uh, that is the GVNI directors. Uh, there are some chief of squads li that like to settle uh, on their own at their level, uh, uh, and some that don't want to take decisions and prefer uh, the directors uh, to take uh, the decisions. 
but you you can have very good uh, level of discussions uh, at the at this stage and then uh, as i said before uh, because of the new ministry of budget of budget and the new government uh, mr gerald darmanin uh, you emphasized that uh, it is better to have a good agreement than a, a bad litigation. So uh, now the uh, chief of squad and uh, the uh, appeal officers, uh, they are really pushed uh, to uh, find uh, some uh, solutions uh, for settlements instead of going to court. So there is really a tendency uh, to discuss and to settle. Uh, from um, let's say my practice uh, and the practice of other uh, colleagues, uh, it is uh, said or understood that they would not go, the tax authorities, lower than uh, 33 to 20 percent of the original amounts. Uh, what also you have to know is that for the tax authorities, they are uh, considered on the amounts uh, tax adjusted, uh, not on the uh, necessarily on the corporate tax itself, but the amounts, uh, the gross amounts of tax adjustments, and 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 this is how they they, they would be uh, they would be judged in uh, in practice. Um, you have, uh, in case you have uh, the will to settle, you have to have uh, probably an amount in mind, but uh, you always need to present a rationale uh, that will cover uh, the amount you want to reach. You, you, you cannot say, uh, I want a settlement for this amount. Uh, you have to find the rationale, and deriving from the rationale, uh, they get to the amount that uh, you originally wanted. The withholding tax uh, on the deemed distributed profit can be abandoned uh, if the, um, and this is by uh, law, by regulation, if the amounts uh, that are adjusted are, are transferred back in France in the hands of the French uh, entity. Uh, if for non-audited years or audited years, you decide to make a rectificative tax return yourself, uh, with, of course, the agreement of the tax authorities, you can have a reduction of 30% of interest for late payment. Interest for uh, late payment at the moment is 2.4% per year. Uh, when you settle, therefore, you have to think of audited and non-audited years. Uh, because uh, transfer pricing being applicable for uh, all the years, uh, you have an issue on audited years, but uh, usually the French tax authorities will ask you to consider non-audited years uh, as well. Uh, so when you settle, uh, don't uh, focus on the number for audited years. Also think uh, that you have to uh, consider and potentially pay for the non-audited years uh, this way you will protect them in a way uh, in many cases uh, they like you to take the commitment uh, not to ask for the EU arbitration convention or the competent authorities uh, they like it uh, because this means uh, less work uh, and that the case is uh, definitely uh, closed so uh, that can help to obtain a settlement you don't need always to ask to to, pro to propose that uh, but when you are in a case that is a little bit difficult uh, it can be a, a pusher uh, to uh, to get the settlement. Um, you have to think about the future uh, in case you make a settlement, uh, because even if uh, in the settlement agreement you say that uh, you have settled but you don't agree with the tax authority's position, uh, in the future, in case of a new tax audit is conducted and you continue with the same method, for instance, you you are using the CUP, there was a substitution of method, the French tax authorities used the TNMM, you settled by discussing the TNMM method, instead of applying the median, you applied the Q1 or some, you, you excluded some comparables and so on, and at the end of the day, you found a number that was satisfying. Uh, if uh, the years are going by, uh, you still applied the CUP method and you, you have a new tax audit, uh, they will apply the 40% penalty of uh, what they, what I can call bad faith, uh, because you continued to use exactly the same method. And uh, when you go for a settlement, uh, we saw that you can avoid the withholding tax uh, cost, uh, but you have to pay corporate tax, of course. Uh, but you have to think of employees' participation. This is a, a compulsory scheme uh, 
uh, where the employees uh, have a participation that is calculated on the taxable income. So employees' participation will be a cost uh, that you will have to pay. And you have to think of the local taxes, that is the CVAE uh, that I mentioned, that is the 1.5% uh, applicable uh, on uh, the uh, added value produced by the company. Uh, an example with uh, the Google case, uh, that was a, a famous case uh, uh, that uh, took place in France. And it's interesting, uh, you have the, uh, sorry, next slide, uh, you, ha you have the, the, uh, the chart uh, in front of you. And it's interesting because on this case, uh, we went from a situation of permanent establishment uh, exposure to a pure transfer pricing discussion but a transfer pricing discussion that was uh, helped, uh, at least for the French tax authorities, by uh, the uh, criminal uh, legislation, the, the criminal procedure, uh, to get a settlement. So, in fact, it was the tax authorities that forced the taxpayer to get into uh, a settlement by using uh, the criminal uh, procedure tool. Uh, so, as you can see here, this is the uh, uh, classical uh, uh, Irish uh, sandwich that is being used. Uh, so the French subsidiary uh, is just a, a pure group service provider uh, invoicing the Irish company on a cost plus basis. Uh, and all the income goes to the first Irish co. Uh, and then most of the profits of the Irish co, they go to a Dutch company and from the Dutch company to the second Irish co. And uh, the second Irish co is managed and controlled in Bermuda and therefore not taxed in Ireland. So. Uh, it always, uh, it's always a funny situation because the, uh, the media and the journalists uh, uh, claim that uh, Ireland is, has a, a very low corporate income tax rate of 12.5%, uh, but the 12.5% is applied on a very small number of the Irish profits because most of the profits end up in Bermuda. And uh, what the uh, French tax authorities uh, tried to do was to demonstrate that uh, the uh, French subsidiary uh, was a permanent establishment of the Irish Co. And this just uh, did not work uh, at all uh, because um, what happened uh, was that this uh, case law was uh, totally, uh, sorry, the approach of the tax authorities was totally contrary to case law of the Supreme Court, which is the Zimmer case. Uh, and uh, uh, the French tax authorities lost uh, in uh, front of the uh, first circuit court, the Tribunal Administratif de Paris, and the Court of Appeal of Paris. And, 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 and so, uh, and this is the next slide, uh, they, they used uh, the French tax authorities uh, alternatively once they had lost in front of the administrative court of appeal they used the TNMM approach uh, and the TNMM approach was that uh, the uh, Irish Co. 1 uh, had uh, functions that were uh, much more, really much more uh, than uh, the one of a pure uh, limited service provider uh, and therefore, they could apply the TNMM and uh, calculate uh, a remuneration uh, based on a percentage of the turnover realized by Google in France. Uh, and the turnover of Google in France is estimated, uh, depending on the various sources, uh, to uh, something like 2 billion uh, euros uh, of turnover. So uh, by doing that, they could enter into uh, uh, the, the, the criminal procedure uh, and uh, they used uh, this criminal procedure to pull Google into a settlement uh, because they said, uh, okay, uh, your transfer pricing approach is not correct uh, and there was tax avoidance because you do should have declared uh, a TNMM uh, and uh, calculated uh, the profits of the French subsidiaries otherwise. Uh, this is exactly uh, what the French tax authorities did in, in the case law I mentioned, the TCL Belgium case law, where, <coughs> where I said that uh, the Q1 uh, was taken uh, from the comparable. And, and because of that, uh, they could show that there was, uh, even if it was limited 
uh, even if it was limited, there was uh, income that uh, elapsed uh, from France. And they were able to, um, therefore, uh, to, um, to make a tax adjustment uh, for uh, for uh, this uh, uh, Google case, and uh, because the uh, taxpayer was uh, afraid of the criminal procedure, they decided to enter into an agreement uh, with the French authorities, legal and tax, and therefore they paid a sort of uh, criminal penalty of 500 million euro and a tax uh, charge of 500 million euro, and the French state uh, managed to get back uh, 1 billion euro of tax, which was the original amount that they hoped to get from the uh, PE exposure. Um, one word uh, on this is next slide on the financial uh, relationships. Uh, here we have uh, interesting developments on uh, the impact of transfer pricing and thin capitalization rules. Uh, depending uh, on whether it is a uh, 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 for foreign uh, lender uh, and therefore an international uh, transaction uh, and a DVNI tax audit, uh, the view can be a little bit different because in many cases uh, the DVNI would focus potentially on, on the demonstration that the rate applied is a market rate. Uh, whereas when it's a, a local situation, uh, the, and when it is the DIRCOFI that is involved, uh, the uh, thin capitalization rules uh, are going to be uh, uh, applied, uh, Article 212 of the French tax code. And uh, in that case, we have a limitation of direct loans from shareholders. So there is a limit, uh, limited interest rate. And you can demonstrate, but then it is for the taxpayer, so it's a reversal of the burden of proof. It is for the taxpayer to demonstrate uh, that uh, a market rate uh, can be applied because it would be higher to the uh, standard uh, tax rate. Uh, and uh, when this is so, uh, the DIRCOFI requests that uh, there is a bank loan uh, that is provided, uh, a bank loan offer uh, that is provided uh, that would be uh, made at the same moment that the intercompany loan was in fact uh, granted. And of course, usually uh, this is an impossible evidence to bring because there was no sort of bank loan. Uh, and in a very interesting uh, advice, uh, the uh, Supreme Court, the Conseil d'État, uh, questioned by the uh, Tribunal of Versailles, First Circuit Court of Versailles, uh, mentioned that uh, it was possible for the taxpayer uh, to bring evidence by a benchmark analysis, uh, like for instance on uh, convertible bonds that are listed uh, through uh, the uh, Bloomberg uh, database. Uh, and therefore, uh, uh, when the question went back to the Tribunal of Versailles, the Tribunal of Versailles uh, decided that the taxpayer won and uh, dismissed the case of the French tax authorities. Uh, so uh, in that case, uh, the thin cap rules, in fact, uh, went back to uh, the transfer pricing uh, benchmark uh, analysis. Uh, and this is very interesting in particular for uh, our uh, LBO practice in France, uh, because this is a, a sort of uh, marketplace tax adjustments, uh, all the loans, uh, that at the moment uh, in, in the uh, LBO transactions that I know of are from, let's say, 7 to a higher of 12%, but usually it's 7, 8, 9% that you see. Uh, they are uh, challenged and uh, reassessed, tax adjusted uh, by the French tax authorities when it is a, a French holding lending to a French subsidiary. It can be quite different when it is a foreign lender lending to a French entity uh, because DVNI uh, has more a tendency to look at benchmark analysis uh, and to accept them uh, when they are well made, of course. Uh, what is next for the future? Uh, that's interesting. That's the new OECD approach. Uh, it's a sort of revolution for the, the, the French authorities because uh, 
uh, using the TNMM approach, uh, in particular for French groups, uh, was in line with their idea that uh, when you have a French group, everything derives from France, and you have to leave very limited profits abroad. And everything has to go back to France because French is the source of everything. Of course, uh, with that view, uh, when they deal with uh, a foreign group that has a subsidiary in France, as I said, the TNMM method, uh, philosophically, if I can say, limits uh, the uh, impact of a tax adjustment because uh, the profitability of comparables, independent comparables, will not be that high, in particular if you use French comparables with uh, the issues we have in France, for instance, uh, on profitability, like, let's say, one of them, uh, the cost of labor. Uh, so uh, the profitability of French comparables is usually not that fantastic. Uh, so in fact, uh, when they try to uh, tax adjust uh, foreign subsidiaries of French groups, they are left uh, with a, a, a limited impact. Uh, now, with the OECD approach, uh, they start to understand and see uh, that uh, the remuneration uh, of a commercial activity, of a, a client relationship, let's say of a marketing intangible, uh, can really take place. Uh, maybe it will take place uh, on a compulsory manner uh, for groups having a turnover higher to 750 million euros uh, through the pillar one. But I think that this will lead them into the idea that maybe they can do better uh, than the TNMM. And this has to be anticipated. And this is where, of course, uh, a value chain analysis uh, discussion can be uh, interesting uh, because uh, this can help a group to anticipate the level of profit that should be left in France because maybe tomorrow uh, the uh, TNMM approach will not uh, remain uh, the golden approach of the French tax authorities. Uh, so I think uh, uh, that's it uh, for now. I, I hope I gave you a, a good overview of uh, uh, the French tax practice in tax audits, uh, and I'm available for, for questions. Thank you, Vincent, uh, for your presentation this uh, afternoon. If you guys would like to uh, provide any questions for Vincent, please do so now. A question from Lauren. Hi, Vincent. Do you have any comments on burden of proof and associated case law? Comments on uh, burden of proof? And associated uh, case law. Um, well, uh, I, I, I don't know uh, exactly what is the, the question, but uh, um, I, I think that uh, uh, you have to, in the, in the case law, uh, the most recent case law, uh, when they look at uh, comparables, uh, it will be for the two parties uh, to present uh, their analysis uh, of comparables, and that will be looked at uh, by, by the judge. So. Uh, when there is a substitution uh, of method that is being made by the uh, tax authorities, uh, the uh, judge is going to look at uh, whether this substitution of method is uh, is possible, is acceptable. Uh, and in that case, uh, if he has found that the substitution of method is acceptable, uh, the two parties uh, will have to to bring their comparables. Uh, this was the case in the GE case law, uh, and make their analysis and and try to uh, challenge the position of one an another. So, uh, uh, in fact, the burden of the proof is on the taxpayer uh, 
when he documents his uh, tax uh, documentation, his transfer pricing documentation, and when there is a tax adjustment, uh, the tax authorities uh, have a lower burden of proof uh, because they just uh, can uh, challenge the method used and substitute another method, present their benchmark analysis, and in fact, the burden of proof is reversed on the taxpayer in that case. And uh, uh, this is not uh, uh, really uh, challenged by the courts uh, that will just uh, examine uh, the various ar arguments of the parties. Okay, the next question comes from Olivier. Uh, do tax authorities accept regional European distribution and manufacturing be benchmarks easily, or do they often require yes. French benchmarks only? No, no. Uh, again, uh, as I said, uh, because we don't have uh, regulations, uh, everything can exist. Uh, but yes, they accept normally easily uh, European benchmark analysis uh, for uh, distribution activity in France. Uh, so, uh, it is in the hands of the taxpayer uh, to potentially use the one that he, that he prefers to use. Usually, uh, the groups, they prefer regional uh, benchmark because uh, uh, they, they, they pay only for one benchmark analysis instead of paying for uh, one analysis per country. Uh, I know that in Italy, the Italian tax authorities, they only accept Italian comparables. Uh, in France, that is not the case. Uh, you can have a, a regional uh, European uh, benchmark that will be accepted. But if you use a French one, it's not a problem either. The next question comes from Velvet. How has French tax authority altered its audit questions in light of CBCR notifications received? Uh, I don't have uh, um, uh, experience of uh, uh, CBCR uh, being specifically used as information in a tax audit. I think that uh, the, the CBCR is, is used to, to target a tax audit, uh, but then uh, they use their standard methods, which is uh, looking at the documentation, uh, requesting the accounts of the subsidiaries or the accounts of the group, uh, if there is one, uh, if it is a listed group, they will look at uh, uh, the uh, listed uh, documents. Um, and I never really saw them uh, specifically use the uh, uh, CBCR elements so far. Is there any other questions for Vincent at this time? There doesn't seem to be any more questions coming in, so I think that'll end our okay. today's webinar. Uh, thank you again, Vincent, for uh, presenting today's topic. Uh, it was a pleasure. Thank you to the attendants. Right. Have a good evening, everyone. Okay. Bye-bye. Good evening. Bye. Bye.